Hi, in a recent video we had a look at these two LoRa PCBs that I'm working on for a little project at home and today I want to start taking a look at the power supply design for these boards. Now these boards need to be continuously powered from the mains and I think they have very slightly differing power requirements. The transmitter, generally speaking, I think is lower power consumption continuously from the, uh, this is based on the data sheet, but then we've got quite a high power consumption whilst it's transmitting. Now the transmit is actually fairly infrequent, so uh, as someone suggested in the previous video, it might be possible to use something like a capacitive dropper, uh, but with a large capacitor or super capacitor, which can just provide enough power while it's transmitting, uh, and then it goes back into that lower power state. On the receiver board, um, the power consumption, even during receive, I think is fairly consistent, uh, but we will have two relays on this board which will then uh, either be driven, uh, both of them continuously, or, or one on and one off, something like that. So uh, this one may actually end up drawing a little bit more power depending on the relays that we're going to use. So uh, first of all, what we'll do is we'll have a look at the power consumption of each of these two boards, and then we'll try and see, first of all, if something very simple like a capacitive dropper will work, but there are other power supply architecture that we might investigate in uh, some future videos as well. So obviously we could use a basic linear transformer. Uh, those are quite big and heavy. Um, so I'd like to avoid that if possible because one of the goals is to try and make this as cheap as possible. And then we've got various switch mode power supplies that we can obviously design for it as well. And certainly I want to take a look at some of those um, and try and design a switch mode power supply that will work at a very low cost. So first of all let's take a look at the power consumption of each of these two boards and today we're going to try using this EGTEX MPOW1203. Now this was actually sent to me by Banggood a couple of years ago but it didn't come with any software and so I wasn't actually able to use it because I wasn't able to find anything for it. Uh, finally I've managed to find the software but I had to set up a, a virtual machine uh, I had to browse some very dodgy Chinese websites and finally managed to download the software uh, onto my PC. This is supposed to be a power supply and power monitor all in one. It allows you to graph currents all the way down to nanoamps. Um, so we'll try this out today, but this is extremely expensive for what it is. I think they were wanting like £400 for this thing, and it doesn't seem particularly high spec, uh, but it looks like it will do the job for what we want to look at today. So here's the software that I was able to find for the power monitor. It's fairly basic in its operation, but we're able to pick an output voltage anywhere from 0.6 to 13 volts. I've just picked 5 volts, which is fine for this PCB. Uh, and then we just need to uh, click power on the interface here, and it powers up this PCB. And then when we click run at the bottom here, it puts the current waveform in the waveform window here. And as it's just sitting here, basically doing nothing, it's in continuous receive mode, we can see that the average current is, as it says here, about 28.2 milliamps. So we're looking at the receiver. Let's send a packet from the transmitter. And we get a little bit of high intensity current here and then a drop in current. So the peak that we're seeing looks to be about 35, 36 milliamps, something like that. Uh, and, but the overall current consumption has only gone up by about 0 0.2 milliamps, which is uh, the current that I'm driving these uh, extremely efficient green LEDs at. So if we light up the other green LED, we'll probably see something about 28.6 milliamps. And there we go, the average is just creeping up as this fills the waveform window. Interestingly, like some of these spikes disappear uh, the density was quite high when both LEDs were off, I thought. Um, yeah, we see a lot more spiky behaviour here, and then it sort of drops off when both the LEDs are illuminated. But what we're seeing, basically, is the average current consumption is about 30 milliamps. Uh, there are some spikes up to 36 milliamps, and we will also need to be able to take into account the fact that we're going to have two relays on this receiver board. So let's take a look at the transmitter. The transmitter is now connected up and powered up, so let's have a look at the current consumption here. Okay, now interestingly this is a lot calmer. We've got a fairly straight line here. Just a little bit of ripple on it, but it's drawing about 24.5 milliamps. So let's see what happens if we try and send a packet. 
and we get quite a big uh, current consumption there. Let's change the scale because we've gone off the scale a little bit there. 100 milliamps, it looks like. Um, let's just run it at 500. I'm not sure how it does the acquisition, whether it's clipping here. So let's run it and we'll send another packet. Yeah, no, it looks like 100 milliamps. So we have this general quiescent power draw of about 26 milliamps here, but we've got one second at 100 milliamps. So this is what uh, might make a capacitive dropper a little bit unsuitable, unless we can store this energy here in a capacitor of some kind, so it doesn't have to be solely provided by the capacitive dropper. I've noted down some of the specifications here for the design. So the transmitter has a 26 milliamp continuous current draw at 3.3 volts, and then an additional 75 milliamps for one second during transmit. On the receiver, we've got that 30 milliamps continuous. And then I had a quick look on RS at the various relays that are available. We can get some with a three volt coil, but they all look like they've got something like a 250 milliwatt coil, which when we've got two of those relays active, that's 150 milliamps at 3 volts or 3.3 volts, which is quite a lot of current actually, because when we look at the generic capacitive dropper circuit, uh, what we've basically got here is we're relying on the reactants of this capacitor at the frequency of interest. So in the UK, we have a 230 volt, 50 hertz supply, and uh, we've got our capacitor equations. We can work out the um, reactants of this capacitor at 50 hertz, and basically that sets the current through this circuit. And we do have to use something like a zenodiode to clamp the output voltage here, because effectively, if we consider this at a fixed frequency, all we've got is a resistor with a capacitor into a zenodiode. So we need to limit the current into this so that we don't just destroy the zenodiode. This resistor here is optional, we probably don't need it. Uh, but basically this zenodiode is gonna um, dissipate all the power that we are not using in our circuit. We can't use a linear regulator, which you'd think might be more efficient, um, because as we reach lighter loads, the node here is going to start rising in voltage, possibly until the point where uh, the input voltage of that linear regulator is exceeded. Now, one thing we might be able to do, um, but it starts to defeat the object of using something simple like this, we could probably clamp this quite a bit higher maybe at 30 volts or something like that, and then use a, a little book converter on the output. That would work, uh, but at that point we may as well just look at a book regulator that can run directly from the mains. I've drawn up the basic circuit here. Now it didn't have a 3.3 volt Zena in the library. Rather than create a new component, I've just used a 4.7 volt Zena for illustration here. We've got our AC input, 230 volts, 50 hertz on the left. We've got a 10 ohm current limiting resistor and then we've set our film capacitor at 3.9 microfarads which gives us about 816 ohms at 50 hertz so that limits the current in general through this entire circuit and if we needed more current we'd increase the value of this capacitor according to this equation here. We've got a bridge rectifier made from four rectifier diodes now we could actually just use two rectifier diodes and two Zenodiodes, and we wouldn't need the zenodiode later on in the circuit, so we can simplify the circuit a little bit if we wanted to. We've got a large electrolytic capacitor, and then we've got our 4.7 volt zener. And then two loads. This is our 30 milliamp load, 156 ohms, and then we're switching in and out 150 milliamps or so, which is representative of the two relays. So let's run this. And if we look at the output of the bridge rectifier, we've got a slightly ripply uh, sort of 4.7-ish volt rail. Now, if we need a particularly regulated rail, then it might be a good idea to use something like this 4.7 volt Zeno and then add a 3.3 volt linear regulator after that to clean up the signal. Now, obviously, this doesn't really matter for things like relays, but if we had any analog electronics, then we might want to be a little bit more careful. So we can see uh, we've got a fairly consistent 30 milliamps. Obviously, this is a resistor, so um, it varies with the voltage. Uh, but you can see we've got a fairly consistent 30 milliamps going across here. And then we're switching in and out this load uh, every so often. I think I've set it up for um, every 100 milliseconds. So you can see when we apply that extra load, the voltage does sag a little bit. Uh, but this is perfectly fine and shows how the system would work. Now, what's actually happening is 
when these relays or this load here isn't active, we're actually dissipating all the power in the Zener. So we can see the current through the Zener diode. When we haven't got the high load turned on, you can see we're dumping lots of power into that Zener diode. And then when we're driving the relays, the current through it almost drops to nothing because we basically just drop slightly out of regulation. So that's about the best we can do with a capacitive dropper. The problem with it basically is we just are continuously burning about half a watt in this circuit, whether or not we've got the relays on or off. Um, that's possibly not too much of a problem, uh, but the Zener diode obviously is going to get quite hot. It's dissipating half a watt all the time. And when you look at things like uh, PIRs on floodlights and that kind of thing, the Zener diode, all this resistor here, are always the things that burn up. There's always some evidence of high temperature on the PCB. So if we can avoid that much power just being burnt continuously, uh, that's obviously preferred. Here's the potential circuit for the transmitter, pretty much the same as before, but with the addition of a 0.47 farad supercapacitor, and that is more than enough to deal with that 100 milliamp burst for one second. The problem is, we have to charge that capacitor, and every time uh, we use the energy for transmission, then this voltage rail is going to drop and start to increase again uh, once we charge that capacitor. And the trade-off that we have is if we want to charge this capacitor quicker, we have to increase the value of the capacitor here, and that increases the current through the circuit, but once this capacitor is charged, then we have to dump the rest of the power in the Zener. So the, the penalty for charging up the capacitor and being able to deal with frequent transmissions is that the standby power is going to be higher. So if we look at this at the moment with the pulse generator disconnected, if we look at the 4.7 volt rail, you can see it's actually taking about 80 seconds to reach uh, the 4.7 volts on this node here. And it's only at that point here where we start dissipating power. Now in this case it's only about 15 milliamps, so uh, that's probably about 70 milliwatts or so being burnt up, which is quite acceptable. I could quite happily deal with that. When we connect up the pulse generator and our load, and we run this again, we can see we get this dip in the voltage rail and this capacitor basically is having to fill in the amount of charge needed for each of those transmissions. So we can see the current through that supercapacitor. We're doing our charging and then we're rapidly discharging here to do our transmissions. So if we wanted to deal with this a little bit better, we'd obviously increase the value of this. Maybe let's uh, put it to 4.7 microfarads and we'll reach 4.7 volts significantly quicker, look, in 10 seconds. But the problem is now, once that capacitor is fully charged, we're dissipate, you know, we're um, conducting about 180 milliamps through that Zener diode, so significantly more power. But as you can see, we'd be able to deal with extremely frequent transmissions if we wanted to. Obviously, with LoRa, we shouldn't be doing that anyway because uh, we'll be using a baller bandwidth for other people. But that's the trade-off we have. We have to decide how much current we're going to pass through the Zener diode at the trade-off of how frequent we want to be able to deal with those transmissions and the amount of time it takes to start up. And so here is the PCB that I've drawn up, obviously not optimised for size at this stage, uh, but we've got the AC coming in on the left, our fusible resistor. We've got a couple of different footprints for the film capacitors because depending on what value capacitor we want to use, sometimes they have a slightly different pin spacing. Then we've got our bridge rectifier arrangement, a capacitor and the supercapacitor at the bottom, and then we've got our Zener diode and our 3.3 volt regulator. So what we're going to do is order this on the PCBWay website. And to do that, we go to PCBWay.com, click on Quick Order PCB, and then we can upload the Gerber file. And once it's uploaded, it processes the Gerber file and gives you a preview of what the PCB should look like, just to make sure you've got the right board uploaded and that it looks vaguely correct. And then we've got all the different options here for prototype PCBs. In this particular example, we don't really have any specific requirements. It's only a prototype board that we're playing around with. So the standard uh, green PCB, 1.6 millimeter thickness with hot air solder leveled finish is absolutely fine for this. And we should get back some very good quality PCBs. I think I probably will uh, check 
the do not add the PCB identification number. Uh, it's $1.50 and that gets rid of the number that they sometimes print on the PCBs for when it's been panelized so they can identify which board is which on the master panel. So that's all there is on the prototype board so we can click save to cart and then we can pick our various delivery options and there are various options available depending on the price you might be able to select the DDP option which prepays the duty so when it gets imported you definitely don't have anything extra to pay in this case because it's a very low cost board there shouldn't be any custom duties anyway we should get uh, tax added at the checkout now if we did have a PCB with some additional requirements like RF traces and that kind of stuff then we might want to select advanced PCBs. There isn't the option here to upload your Gerber file directly. You put the size and the details in and then later on in the checkout you add the Gerber file and then it gets checked. But this gives you some additional options like the board spec. We can also pick different PCB materials if needed for RF applications that kind of stuff or higher temperature applications. And we've got a whole bunch of extra options all the way up to 60 layer PCBs. And you can see we've got some additional colours of PCBs. So that's a good option if you have a slightly higher requirement PCB. So we're going to order these boards. And when they arrive, hopefully next week, we're going to build these up. So I hope you enjoyed the video. Don't forget to visit PCBWay if you're thinking about getting some boards made. A big thank you to my Patreon supporters. And until next time, thanks for watching.